Welcome everyone and thank you for attending today's Public Health Communications Collaborative Webinar. My name is Nadine Gracia and I'm the President and CEO of Trust for America's Health. And we are so pleased that you are joining us today. Since 2020, the Public Health Communications Collaborative has worked tirelessly to produce timely science-based resources to support communicators to address public health issues, to build public confidence, and identify and counter misinformation. Since PHCC began its webinar series, we've brought together public health leaders to speak about the communications challenges in COVID-19 of the moment and offer on the ground insights and practical tips that our audience can take back to their communities all across the country. Today, as we consider the current state of the COVID-19 pandemic, we'll be looking not only at the present moment, but also look back over the past two years, and importantly, a look at what's ahead for public health communications. Today, we'll hear from three leaders from about key insights from their department's COVID-19 communications efforts and how those lessons are informing strategies now and in the future, not only in times of crisis, but also every day to advance health and well-being. During the panel, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat by sending a message using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Our speakers are gonna have time to answer several of your questions. And as always, today's webinar is being recorded and that recording will be available on the Public Health Communications Collaborative website later this week, along with all of the previous webinars we have held and other COVID-19 communications resources, including what we are excited about the release of a new resource that accompanies today's webinar that you'll hear about a little later. Now, leading up to the two-year anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic, PHCC conducted a national survey asking our community to take two minutes to answer two questions. And we received more than 600 responses from 49 states, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands from communicators who hold many different roles at health departments, from non-governmental organizations, healthcare facilities, schools, and more. We heard about innovative tactics to reach constituents, how to listen to your audience and tailor your messaging to the needs of your community. Importantly, how to center equity in your COVID-19 communication strategies and other key lessons. Now, I'm sure many of you in attendance today responded to the survey and we thank you for sharing your stories, your reflections, and lessons learned from two years of COVID-19 communications. Our team reviewed every submission and interviewed communicators from the field to dig into these lessons. And with your support, we've created a crowdsourced resource featuring learnings and insights for promoting and protecting the public health through COVID-19 and beyond. So today we are thrilled to have three esteemed panelists joining us. Dr. Yingying Go, the Director of Pub Public Health and the Health Officer of the Pasadena Public Health Department in California. Julie Pride, a Public Health Administrator at the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District in Illinois. And Frank Krupa, Public Health Director and Mental Health Commissioner of the Tompkins County Health Department in upstate New York. So we'll start with their introductions. First, Dr. Yingying Go is the Director and Health Officer of the City of Pasadena Public Health Department and a board certified pediatrician. She pre previously served in various roles at the Health Department, including Health Officer and Deputy Director and Medical Director for Programs and Research where she secured grant funding and managing programs addressing chronic disease, including improving health outcomes for older adults with diabetes and also childhood obesity prevention. Her professional experience includes clinical pediatric practice, management of a California endowment task force to improve healthcare access and quality in Los Angeles County, and community-based participatory research to improve nutrition and physical activity for youth. Our next speaker is Julie Pride. Ms. Pride is a licensed social worker and certified public health administrator. She serves as a public health administrator of Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, a nationally accredited health department. 
She began her career at the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District in 1995, working with the HIV AIDS program and served as the director of the Division of Infectious Disease Prevention and Management until 2007, when she was appointed as the Public Health Administrator. She is currently a member of the Illinois State Board of Health, a participant in the Kresge Foundation's Emerging Leaders in Public Health, and serves on the board of the National Association of County and City Health Officials. And our third speaker is Frank Krupa. Mr. Krupa was appointed in 2011 as the Public Health Director of the Tompkins County Health Department in New York, and also assumed mental health commissioner duties in 2015. Mr. Krupa began his public health career in 2001 as an environmental specialist at the St. Lucie County Health Department in Florida. He has focused his public health work on preventing teen pregnancy, decreasing tobacco use among youth, and developing strong public health organizations. He also has extensive emergency preparedness and response experience. Mr. Krupa is a past president of the New York State Association of County Health Officials. So our panelists today represent three of the departments uh, that truly are doing really important work and that we have spotlighted in this new resource that the Public Health Communications Collaborative will be releasing after today's webinar. So we're excited now to hear from our impressive lineup of speakers. Dr. Go, Julie, Frank, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. So for our first question, uh, I'd like to share one of the questions that we actually asked our community leading up to the moment of uh, the two years of the pandemic. We asked our community in 2002, what are the traits of an effective communicator? And what you'll see on screen, if we put, this, put that slide back up on screen, you'll see that word cloud, you'll see on the screen our most common responses uh, from the PHCC survey. And I'd like to turn to each of you to ask you, what's the number one characteristic, maybe even a mantra that you've held most closely uh, for yourself as a public health communicator and why? Let's start with Dr. Go and then we'll move to Frank and then Julie. Thanks Nadine. For me, it really um, is that big word that was in the middle of that word cloud, which is empathy and non-judgment. Um, and I think um, ex an extension of that, having an open mind with active listening and having the humility to throw out the assumptions that I came in with, uh, because I think that's really um, uh, the, the other half of communicating besides um, doing the talking is the listening and um, being willing to hear, truly hear what it is others, uh, where people are coming from. Um, I, I will go to Frank next and then oh, just sorry. Sure, no problem. So I, I would just share for me, it was consistent honesty. Um, you know, as we've moved through the pandemic, I can remember back in January of 2020, telling my county legislature that, you know, coronaviruses were the common cold, right? Because I knew nothing about what was coming from COVID-19. And that really carried forward for the next two years was being able to tell our community that we didn't always have the answers. We didn't know exactly how things were gonna happen, but here's what we did know. Um, and here's why we're asking them to change, you know, their behaviors and, and how they live their lives every day. Um, and I think just being consistent with that honesty throughout really created the public relationship that we needed to, you know, encourage our community to, to make the behavior changes we were hoping for. Okay, I, I think with me, it was definitely just communicate, communicate, communicate constantly. Um, I like Dr. Go, uh, believed that it was super important uh, to be empathetic when, especially when I was getting um, direct questions from the community, which I got a ton of. There were a lot of people who were just very scared. And, you know, I think our very first communication, we went out publicly back in, you know, January of 2020, and we said, you know, this is likely going to be a pandemic. This is what you should start doing now. And the main thing you need to do is learn to get your information from trusted sources. And here are three trusted sources. Um, luckily, I was in a state where the governor and the director, the director of public health at the state level were doing daily communication and it was excellent. And so we were able to build on that and then just um, 
answer specifics, you know, to our community. So it was mostly just answering questions as well as putting out information and letting people know that this is going to change and it's going to continue to change. And every time it changes, we will try to be right out there um, explaining why. Such, such key and critical lessons around the empathy and listening um, as, as, as you noted, and, and certainly with regards to that transparency and honesty of the communication, sharing what you know, and then helping to inform the public that things will change and, and that you're gonna to continue to communicate. And, and Julie, you, you resonated around the communicate, 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 and that, that need to do that constant communication. Uh, you know, today we're, we're talking about communicating through COVID-19, which is um, both the, the look back, a, a reflection on our COVID-19 communications, but also looking forward and looking ahead. Um, and so we can consider really the moment that we're in right now regarding the pandemic where we're seeing uh, cases and hospitalizations in most of the country uh, that are decreasing considerably. But even as precautions you know, have been relaxed and more Americans are, are saying they feel that the pandemic, we, we, we moved beyond or it's, it's, it's over. Uh, we're seeing still, though, a slight uptick in areas across the country that could forecast um, another wave and, and needing to be prepared. Uh, you know, in this period of, of transition, you know, we have hope, but, but there's also still uh, some uncertainty. What are the core messages that you're now focusing on uh, in your community and how are you working to, to deliver those messages? Uh, Frank, we'll start with you. Hey, thanks, Nadine. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, in my community, we have the highest case numbers we've had throughout the pandemic right now. Um, so part of what our messaging shift has been around um, data and focusing on severity of illness, hospitalizations and such, rather than focusing on case counts. Um, and then really it, the big message shift was from community-based response to self-responsibility. Right? How can each individual um, make choices with the information available to them to protect themselves? Meaning those that are you know, immunocompromised or are seniors, um, they should be wearing masks when they're out and about in certain situations and really just trying to evaluate risk for themselves based on the information we can provide um, and making those personal decisions to protect them and their families versus what was very broad-based community interventions, you know, with shutdowns and everyone wearing a mask and, you know, distancing and all of those other things that we were asking everyone to do. It really has shifted to that self-responsibility uh, message now. Uh, thank, thank you, Frank, for, for noting that, um, you know, the data that's actually being used, right? And, and have you seen, with regards to just following up on your question, um, how you have evolved with that communications? Are there tips and lessons you would share specifically with regards to how you make that shift and ensuring that the community continues to have trust in, in the message that you're sharing? Because it seems that, that what we're utilizing may seem to have changed over time. The, the, the best things that we did was we told people before we did made changes. So as our data tables were adjusting, we a few months prior to that, we were already talking about the shift uh, in what data we were going to be focusing on. So when it actually happened, uh, you know, from a visual perspective and the information we were sharing every day, uh, people were prepared for it and kind of understood that. Now, you know, we still have... Uh, my, many in our community that are concerned that um, you know case counts are as high as they are and, and our focus is not there um, but we've continued to just try to, to communicate that yes we're still watching those numbers and they're certainly still important but as we transition you know through the pandemic uh, we are shifting our public health approaches and balancing interventions against how the disease is uh, creating severity in our communities and so I think just that early and constant communication is really what's helped us be successful. Excellent, excellent. And using the data to help drive those, those messages and inform the public, absolutely. Um, you know, in light of what, what Frank shared with regards to utilizing that data, how to then shift and, and, and evolve the messaging really that's responsive um, to, to that. Um, you know, is this the same? Uh, are you seeing and experiencing the same in, in Pasadena and in and, and, uh, Champagne Urbana, or are you um, finding something different about your local uh, communications landscape? We'll start with Julie and then um, uh, go to Dr. Go. Well, one of the things that we're really trying to uh, continue to communicate is that vaccines are still available, they're still effective, and it doesn't really matter that you haven't gotten it yet. Um, we don't care the reason at all, you know, that we're still here, we still have plenty of vaccine available, and that we welcome 
everyone in. It's kind of a you know no judgment zone as far as people coming into getting getting vaccinated. If you're coming in for your fourth or your first, we don't really care. We're going to make it as easy as possible. And I think and we're doing very much what Frank said, and that is you know really shifting to this is what our community looks right like right now. And we even expand that to say, you know, with the CDC's great site, we'll say, go in, if you're traveling here, look at this, where you're going, see what it is, so you can make your own decisions based upon that. And we have something similar that we started years ago for West Nile virus. And it's basically like, this is where our community is now. If we're here, do this. If we're here, do this. If we're here, do this. And it's that same type of thing. And we just put it out there and so we're, you know, we're seeing the cases um, ticking up and that will concern some people and what we, then we have to get out there and explain, you know, why that is and um, start really shifting to what are the hospitalizations looking like, you know, and because that is what we're obviously most concerned about is a serious illness and death. So that is what we're really trying to prevent and letting people know that, that they, they have some control over it now. At the beginning, there was really, we were all in the same boat. There was really nothing anyone could do except for the non-pharmaceuticals. Now we have you know, all these tools available, the vaccinations, the therapeutics, the testing, everything. So people need to um, incorporate that into their behavior. Julie, I'm really glad you brought up the point about um you know, the, the being non-judgmental, uh, right, in, in the communications as well, and the point you're raising around uh, also stating vaccine is still available, still encouraging the vaccine, not asking why haven't you gotten the vaccine yet, and, and really being able to meet people where they are uh, in, the, in the communications. I think that's such a, an important point in, in, in utilizing as well the data to then help them be empowered to make those informed decisions. Yeah. Dr. Go, what's the experience that you're having in, uh, in Pasadena? There are a couple messages. Um, the number one and always number one is to lead with vaccine because um, of course it's the most effective um, intervention that we have and safe intervention, but really to emphasize that it's different now. We have a year of data um, to and millions and millions of people safely vaccinated and how this is not the same situation that people who are considering vaccine a year ago are in. We know that it's safe and it works, and we know um, what the risks are and how to mitigate those risks where there are. So um, that that's number one. I think um, with people with people moving with the case rates coming down after the Omicron surge in the winter, um, and the feeling of oh I'm just done with this pandemic and it's, this is the new normal we should just live with it. Um, I think that's really dangerous. I, I really try to um, encourage people to stay informed and to watch where we are because we know that there's going to be change. And there will be times when we'll have more cases and we're seeing what's happening on the, on the East Coast. And now for us, we're messaging that it's time to prepare. It's time to get up to date on those shots. It's time to get, you know, um, to use these tools that we're used to now. They're not strange mitigation measures to put on a mask. So we encourage people to be ready to do that um, because we think that what is happening um, out East is gonna move over here um, as we've seen over and over again. And then I think um, we do, the, what's interesting about this is, yes, we are um, doing the personal risk messaging as well to identify your own risk, to take the layers of mitigation that you need to protect yourself. But, but at the same time, I think it's really important to remind people um, that their responsibility doesn't end there, that the people who are at greater risk or worse outcomes from COVID, um, and, and this is because we have a high vaccination rate here, that people feel generally safe. But the, the people who are at higher risk aren't strangers. They're your, your friends and family around you. And so you, um, even if you have a mild case, uh, have a responsibility to ensure that you don't pass it on to others. Um, and so I think, um, and also at the organizational level. So people in our community, they, they're employers. They um, run organizations. They may be, you know, run schools. And they have the responsibility to use what we've taught them or what they've learned over these past two years about what can reduce reduce risk. And even though public health is not requiring all of them, we strongly recommend many of them. And so it's it, there's a responsibility for these um, organizations to implement uh, those risk mitigation measures for the people that they serve. Dr. Go, you, you importantly um, 
several great messages that you that you just shared for for our audience and and one of them that I just wanted to draw out was how you spoke about um, while we may be seeing certain trends, it's not time to, for example, let our guard down and still be able to educate the community for the community to understand this. Are you finding specific approaches that are really effective with regards to, um, you know, dealing with where people may have fatigue and they're saying we're, we're kind of done and we, or we think that the pandemic is over. Are there specific approaches and strategies you're finding most effective in that messaging? Um, you know, I think that, um... It's, I think it's okay when risk is low, our community level of COVID is low um, and our healthcare system is not overburdened to let people relax a little bit. And it is our job as public health to keep thinking about it. And so even if people forget about it for a little while, it's okay. Um, we try to maintain our presence and, our, um, and remind people that um, we'll, let them know. I think Julie touched on this too. We'll, we'll let them know. We'll be the messenger. So let us bear that burden. But at this, so you don't need to check the dashboard every day necessarily like we were asking you to before, but that, but to listen to the messages when we are here, when we, when we put them out. So I think it's a little bit of give and take. At some point. Thank you. Well, you know, you've all raised to the importance of not only delivering the message, but having the trust in the message. And, and so one of the consistent themes we've focused on is the certainly the importance of trusted messengers and, and building relationships um, with those messengers who already have trust in the community. Um, Dr. Go, you spoke about the innovative ways uh, when we were meeting with you around uh, the work that you've done in Pasadena with students in schools. And, and Frank, we got to hear from you about um, the launching of a community ambassador program uh, in Tompkins County. Can each of you speak to how you're actually working to maintain these relationships both now and beyond the pandemic and how you're utilizing those relationships really to advance public health across a whole host of issues. So not only for something like a public health emergency and, and response, but everyday public health issues. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Dr. Go and, and then go to Frank. So uh, we, we really um, found it um, very helpful that we had established relationships and that we had um, you know, cultivated over the years. And so, um, and throughout the pandemic, we've had much tighter partnerships. And I think that's an opportunity going forward to build on what's there. Um, with the schools, for example, we um, conduct substance use prevention, uh, substance abuse prevention programming with, in, in the classroom. And, um, and then we partner on uh, nut our nutrition programs and also um, uh, collaborate on mental health uh, awareness for youth. And so with a lot of interactions, in addition to our emergency preparedness um, exercises on flu school-based uh, flu vaccination clinics. So all of those things, I think, um, are, represent ongoing um, demonst demonstrated investment on the public health department's part in our community organizations, such as schools. And, um, and I think one of the things we always try to do is to have transparency and to bring to be a resource to our partner and even to bring funding do dollars to them. And I think they really appreciate that where we demonstrate that, um, you know, when we're able to, where there are, when we identify opportunities that we um, are happy to share and to facilitate um, the flow of, of resources, including funding to those organizations because they are performing the public health mission in the role that they play. Um, the other school I, that's mentioned in the report is the, the art center. So that's on the other end of the spectrum from K-12 schools, we've got uh, specialized um, institutes of higher education and that's a new, a, a new partnership. It was one that we had identified that we wanted to utilize, but we never had the funding to help fund some of the, the students to work with us on say an STD campaign or you know some other kinds of um, places where we thought uh, it would be useful to have the help of art students um, to develop messaging. And with the pandemic, we were able to do that. Um, it in, involves a commitment on our part and time on our part. For example, when the students work, um, well, there, there are a couple components. They have faculty who are committed to the social mission. They believe in social innovation. And so this is a good foundation for us because they're committed to working with us and teaching the students. And then we have to put the time in to attend their courses and you know, review their projects and give them input and do the teaching for the students. And in that way, they're able to give back to us through giving back to the community. 
So it's definitely, um, uh, uh, you know, a partnership, a true partnership. I, I really, um, my ears, <laughs> I, I caught the cord where you said you had the existing partnerships, but what you've also seen is a tightening of the partnerships, tighter partnerships through this process. And also the fact that you importantly raise, and, and most of you have, have done this as well, is also providing the funding and the resources because oftentimes we're asking communities, organizations, other sectors to, to engage in, in these efforts and don't have the resources. So the fact that you can actually provide those, uh, that funding and resource support, critically important. We have also, um, not successfully yet, but we think um, we're gonna try again, sought funding together. So mm -hmm. going to private foundations and together as a partnership and saying, we'd like to do this. Frank, your thoughts? Yeah, so you know, we here in Tompkins County are the home of Cornell University and our population because of that is more diverse than you might expect for a county our size in rural upstate New York. Uh, and so we had a responsibility to reach uh, populations that to be quite honest, we haven't been super successful with um, as a health department, you know, in our past, um, but this was really a no-fail game. So we had to we had to figure things out. And one way that we did that was using some of those existing relationships that we had in some communities that uh, are were harder for us to reach. And uh, we were able to create some positions and and bring on some individuals that um, either were volunteering or had lived experiences or were you know parts of communities that we hadn't been able to reach. And that really launched our ambassador program. Um, and originally, its concept was, you know, we were taking information out into the community about vaccines um, and just trying to make sure that, you know, we had things in the right languages and there were trusted messengers and, you know, all the things that, that we talk about. Um, but I think what we learned and what was most valuable to us is the information that came back. Um, those individuals were members of uh, communities that we hadn't traditionally been uh, successful in, in reaching uh, as much as we had wanted. And they were able to kind of bring back to us, you know, hey, you know, your messaging should be a little different, or um, here's what they need in order to be successful in getting to a, um, getting to a vaccine appointment or trusting enough to, to be willing to get the vaccine. And so that really helped shape our approach moving forward is that information that came back to us. And, um, Quite frankly, that, that wasn't the thought going in. We were really, it was about us getting our message out. And I think we've heard the theme throughout today is, you know, listening to others is what makes for effective communication. And um, that, that was really, you know, we were really excited that that was, you know, what came out of that project. And we've been fortunate that our legislature has, you know, provided us funding to create some community health worker positions uh, to be able to maintain this because once, you know, we're, once we transition away from just doing COVID, um, it, this will, you know, carry weight on all of the many public health issues that, you know, our communities uh, are, are, you know, normally unheard or uh, underserved communities uh, need. And so we're looking forward to, to being able to sustain that and expand our work, you know, throughout the programming we offer at the health department. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you both. You know, Julie, uh, our team got, uh, we had the opportunity to interview both you and your deputy. And, and one thing that, um, that stood out to us was the commitment as is being discussed today to transparency, to openness amid uncertainty. Um, how do you think that that approach has actually impacted your community's relationship with and the understanding of the role of public health? And, and how are you maintaining that approach moving forward? Well, a lot of our community groups that we met with and, and worked with, you know, hand in hand during COVID um, and still are, you know, we definitely are going to maintain those. Some of these were previous relationships that we, you know, strengthened um, during COVID. But moving forward, it's, you know, it's the same type of thing. If um, it, we're, we go out, we make a commitment to pretty much go out and speak to any group <laughs> that asks us. And sometimes we ask them. So we will speak to every single um, every single opportunity we have. We will take that to speak with whether it's Rotary or you know faith based groups, whether it's um, you know an article in the newspaper, whether you know whatever it is, we we will do that. Um, and we, and we're committed to doing that regardless of the day or time or anything like that. So we do a lot of things in the evenings. Um, and on weekends. And, you know, that's important because, again, 
it's not what's convenient for us that is effective. It's what's, what is convenient for and what, what do the, the individuals we're trying to reach? What do they need? And so we just have to be open to them telling us what that is and then doing it. So uh, that is really kind of easy, honestly. I mean, they're, they're, they're telling us what we have to do. And you know, we, we make an effort always to look to what the census calls, you know, traditionally undercounted, um, the, because if they're being undercounted, they're being underserved, they're being under messaged, they're, you know, everything. So we really make a commitment, not just during COVID, but even prior to that, to, to making sure that we have one-on-one um, -on -one relationships with someone, some type of leader in the group, if not entire organizations or, um, or networks. So that, that's just been, I think, the, the most successful way to do it. And lots of being available to answer questions, because if you're running an agency or you are, you know, a, the, a pastor or a minister or a mom or whatever, we want to be there to ask, answer your questions. You're getting questions directly. We want to answer those. And then those individuals become, you know, super spreaders of correct information for us. So we want to always be available for for that, and um, and it, it's it's not that it's not really that difficult to do. I, I I wish it was some you know magical thing, but it's pretty much answering the phone, the email, the text whenever you get them. Absolutely, being accessible, uh, as you noted, and and you you we had also said communicate, 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 and be accessible uh, in that communication. Absolutely, uh, you know something we we hear from our webinar audience uh, and. And we really enjoy their, their feedback is how much they value um, really the practical recommendations and strategies uh, that they can take back to their community. So for our last question, before we open it up to the audience uh, q and I'd like to ask each of you to um, reflect on, as you've been doing, uh, communications during the pandemic and as you're looking ahead uh, to the future, uh, what is one thing about your department's communications that perhaps you're leaving behind? Uh, and what's one thing that you're taking forward with you uh, beyond the COVID, as we continue to move through and beyond the, the pandemic? I don't, I'm open to anyone to start. I, I can start on that one. Well, I think one thing that we're leaving behind is anything that involves paid advertising. That, that's just not <laughs> that's just not effective for us um, usually. But what has been really successful is what I mentioned before, you know, the one-on-one -on -one communication and something that really worked during COVID, especially reaching seniors who we were obviously really trying to reach out to. Um, and typically we're reaching out to a younger audience through our social media and through the, the various things that we do. But with reaching seniors, um, the newspaper allowed us to have a little column in there where people were able to ask questions and we were answering the questions. And that went on for the whole first year and then some of, of the pandemic. And that really was um, appreciated by our community, it seems like. So that is something that I would not hesitate to do again. Um, it takes very little effort um, on our end. And it was, uh, for those who do read the paper, it was very, very, um, appreciated by them. And then, of course, we could take those same questions and then push them out through all of our other channels that we do. But we were being able to get a sense of what the questions were that were that were coming in. So um, I think that's something that we will do moving forward on all types of things. If we ever have any type of a big event, we will we will definitely use that approach um, where it's just daily um, consistent communication. And I think one thing we're leaving behind is trying to create the perfect message. Um, I think early on in the pandemic, we spent hours and hours and hours and days in some instances trying to, you know, make every word perfect and make sure it could be interpreted only one way. And um, really, it just slowed us down in getting our messaging out. And, you know, what we know is, as folks have talked about today, is consistency and communicating often as things change and just letting folks know you know, that we don't know everything and here's here's what we know now. And if it's not right tomorrow, it's okay. It was right today. And that's, you know, what we have. So leaving that perfection behind and, and taking forward that um, it takes a team. 
uh, to do our communications, right? At my health department, my health promotions director, about 10% of her job description was public information officer. And that was it, right, that we had. And um, we knew that wasn't going to be enough. So we quickly brought, you know, all of the counties you know, public information expertise and put together a joint information team. And um, that, that team of people really churned out the information. They made me sound really smart. Um, and I, I thank them for that because they really crafted the message. They were hearing from the public and the media and our partners about what they wanted to hear. And they were able to really synthesize the information in a way that we as the, the you know, the, the spokesperson could get that information out to folks. So knowing that it takes a team and that it can't be one individual or even just part of one individual trying to do all the messaging for the department. And so as we're moving forward, we're, we're looking to expand our internal team and also continue to lean on our partners and our other county departments to, to help us with our message development. So I asked um, some of our experts what they what their answer was. Um, this is our promotoras team, the community outreach team, um, the mostly women um, who are on the streets, talking to people, knocking, going door to door um, at the laundromats and and grocery stores. And I found their response very insightful. So I just wanted to read it and share it. Um, one thing they said that they would leave behind is the need to know answers to all the questions people have regarding COVID nineteen and other health topics. They, um, moving forward, would like to get more comfortable with the unknown and the idea of not knowing because the most impactful conversations have really come from them sitting back and listening and providing empathy. It has been difficult to communicate with the community at times when messaging from the media and government agencies are confusing. When was, when was that? All the time, right? So um, the promotors expressed that Rooting their conversations in empathy without judgment has helped address the mistrust and confusion, even when they don't have all the answers, because at least they can provide clear strategies to stay safe, even if the person is hesitant to get vaccinated. So I, I thought that was very helpful. And then um, moving forward, really, truly, we know that we need a full time public information officer. Uh, we like other departments, it sounds like, um, have people who are doing full-time jobs and then our PIO on top of their jobs and, you know, with experience and very talented, but we need more of that resource. And I think it's, it speaks to how we um, underestimate how important the public, our role is as communicators in public health, that that's a big part of our job and we should have the resource um, dedicated to that uh, because it requires expertise. Uh, technical and skills in, in, in the communication realm. And so um, we don't have funding for that. That's not a, a core public health, you know, um, uh, function that's, that's, that's funded and, and it should be. Um, so we're looking for options, but really that needs to be addressed, I think, fundamentally, where um, the importance of that, the job of doing public health communications um, is, is uh, given the, the resources that it deserves. And um, one more thing was just, um, we've dabbled in social media. So, so, you know, the PIO would need to have expertise in how to use social media. We, we, I think that is where the misinformation thrives and that is where we should be putting um, accurate information. And um, we tried with our um, youth contest for, for K-12 schools for, um, promoting vaccine for our art contest that we conducted. For the first time, we put in some money for Google ads and Facebook ads. And so we're just starting, but really we should be investing more in that because it's effective, it works. Um, so those are my comments. Well, you are garnering a lot of, uh, of support and interest in, in the chat from the, from the audience that were head, you know, the head nods here just with regards to the importance of that communications capacity and the message, you know, really saying we've got to be timely with the message and really listening and, and being able to adapt uh, is critically important to reach communities. And thank you, Dr. Go, for sharing uh, the voice of Promotoras as well uh, in, in that response. Um, so we're going to open it up uh, to now to questions for our speakers from the audience. And so again, please feel free to submit your questions by sending a message to all hosts and panelists. Uh, and be sure to include your affiliation in your question submission. Uh, and we'll, um, I'll start us off with the, um, the first 
uh, area of the audience questions, we've, we've gotten several questions um, that are focusing on combating misinformation. We actually just started to touch on that. And the question, one person asked, how do you recommend public health communicators position themselves as a leader of valid information in a world of misinformation? Uh, and another asked, do you have any advice for effectively combating health misinformation either online or at in-person public events? And I think you just touched on the, you know, some, some of the ways in which you've done this, but um, let's turn to you specifically with this audience question since it's garnered so much interest. Frank, let's start with you. I think the, the misinformation has been, you know, challenging. And I think one of the, the I guess, most relieving days was when we decided we can't combat Twitter and Facebook and, and everything else and all the misinformation that's out there. So how do we get our message out? And that's really what we were focused on was how are we reaching our community, right? As much as I wanna convince everyone in New York and the rest of the country to do what I need them to do, my focus needed to be on Tompkins County. And so we developed mechanisms to reach directly to folks. We set up so people could sign up for a, an email list and they got every one of our press releases directly to them. Um, you know, we did start to use social media and get our message out there so we could point people to those things. And even sometimes more importantly, so that others could use our links to counter, you know, some of the misinformation that, that was out there. So it really was a focus on what mattered for our community, what people were asking for. Um, and I think our early efforts to get a lot of messaging out consistently and often um, really drew people to us. And so um, our community was looking to us for information and wasn't relying on other sources um, that, that might not be providing you know, information that, that we would support. So, so that was really the, the main focus was you know, targeting our community who, who we were trying to reach and making sure our messaging was getting to them um, through multiple avenues um, you know, to combat that. The misinformation is out there and you know, we, we try to, whenever we can, particularly if it gets targeted at us on our social media to make sure we provide accurate information that counters whatever the message might be. Um, but, but really the focus was on our local community and making sure we reach them uh, as effectively as we could. Julie, your thoughts on this? Uh, mine is very similar to Frank's. I mean, there was so much misinformation out there. Um, what, what I did was on social media, I would answer every single, what appeared to be a legitimate question. Anything that was leading and trolling and trying to, you know, cause problems or whatever, I, those were just basically ignored. And really when we analyzed, and of course we analyzed it because that's what we do, like how many of these messages we were getting, we were getting a ton of messages, but it was really from a tiny handful of people. It's a, a tiny handful of people that seem to be absolutely obsessed with us, um, but still a tiny handful of people. And we just, like Frank said, we, it, it, we just went beyond it. Now, am I going to say that it wasn't hard for me to get beyond that? It was, especially at the beginning, because I was literally making myself um, exhausted by trying to combat all that. And then finally, it was just like, that's not worth doing it. I will answer every single legitimate you know, question that we get. Um, and just keep putting out the information. I mean, in my community, I'm super lucky, you know, being here with the University of Illinois and we have two large health centers. And so we, we were all on the same message. We were promoting the same message because it was the accurate message. So people that wanted accurate information knew where to get it. Here we were with it and um, we were putting it out everywhere. So, uh, and the other thing is I could get you know, if I needed to, a virologist could get on there and help explain how something worked or an immunologist or, you know, a, a infectious disease specialist or a material science specialist or an engineer. So, you know, being able to actually bring those people in to um, explain things that are way above my um, ability to explain. Because again, in our community, we have people who want that information. There's, you have to communicate at every level and you can't just ignore um, people because their questions are difficult um, like, but I again I'm lucky to have that resource we did a lot of things on radio we did a lot of things on on cable tv those little um, you know cable shows that are are like community access and then those again everything we did could then be shared on social media so that it sort of and could be translated and could be spread out through, you know, the the various 
platforms, WhatsApp and those things that other people use that um, I don't know how to use, but we, we had people who could, could spread that same message in a, every type of way possible. And including, you know, somebody asked in there, what type of platforms do we use on social media? Because I'm a boomer, I use Facebook, and then I have staff who can use Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and the other ones. We also use things like Grindr and, uh, you know, meet apps where we reach out through for our HIV program. We use those. We reach out through the channels that we reach our injection drug population. We reach out through every single channel that we use for other public health um, messages because everyone needs that information. So we make sure that we put in the effort to try to reach everyone. Dr. Go, you work on misinformation? Yeah, um, you know, I, I know that we can never match the volume of misinformation with the volume of accurate information, but if we don't put the accurate stuff out there, then it's zero, zero to a gazillion and versus, you know, some. So, it, so people have to at least see it. So it, it is our responsibility to, to put it out there on, on the places where they're seeing this messaging. And then the other point is just, of course, of what we all know, which is the messenger matters and it's the trusted messenger and we aren't always the trusted messenger for people. So we have to, and we have tried to um, work with our community organizations, our faith-based leaders, um, everyone that touches people in their daily lives um, and that's looked different um, all throughout the pandemic, depending on what level of stay at home we were at. Um, but to have those people, have some of those folks um, have the accurate information and be bought into sharing that, um, that those interactions really count. You know, the, the, the research does show that healthcare providers still hold a very, um, High, that people still have a high level of trust in general with healthcare providers. Um, and so I think even that, um, and there's a question in the chat about uh, pediatricians and working with parents. I'm not seeing pediatric patients every day or working with families every day and one-on-one -on -one in a clinical setting. And so we've done communication with our pediatricians because they weren't always promoting vaccine. They weren't always bought in. And so we wanted to make sure we answered their questions and then we did specific um, uh, um, specific forums for different audiences. When the pediatric vaccine was approved, we um, spoke with different school communities and had a lot of attendance because parents had legitimate questions they wanted answered. And not all of them are going to the pediatrician all the time to get those answers answered. And um, pediatricians can't, it's hard for them to do one-on-one. -on -one. And so we're doing kind of large, um, scale, more large scale messaging to support that one-on-one -on -one messaging, hopefully that, that parents would get. Um, and, and we were holding um, forums and now we can do it in person. We're planning one um, in Spanish language for our, our community um, to, to talk about, um, to talk about vaccine. Again, talking about vaccine, um, where we are today and where ind and the individuals are um, in, in their um, thought process and, and knowledge. So, um, so it continues in many, many forms. Let's move to some more audience questions and um, we'll move through these where we'll just have one of you answer these and try to get uh, through as many more as we can uh, in our time remaining. So we've got the question, how do you evaluate the success of your health communications efforts for COVID-19 and beyond? And this is uh, from a public information officer at Lorain County Public Health in Ohio. I'd like to take that one. I I can um, Please, Julie, talk, talk to that one. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did was mainly we looked at the vaccination uh, rates and how we were reaching them, uh, how we were reaching individuals with that messaging um, for specific clinics or, or certain things that we're doing. And, oh, someone asked that you repeat the question. Yep, absolutely. So that question is how do you evaluate the success of your health communications efforts for COVID-19 and beyond? So again, we looked at outcomes of, of messaging and were we reaching individuals? Um, but for example, if we had a specific, we had a 75 and older clinic, were we reaching out? We knew the numbers in our community, how many were getting that message, how many times did it take to make sure that we reached everyone with that message? We also, of course, kept metrics on 
um, who was reached by the newspaper articles, how many people were going to our website, which, which items were of, seemed to be of more use. Um, and then we could also look at questions that we were asked or we were being asked and then how often they were being you know, asked again to, to try to help a little bit gauge uh, penetration of message. But um, there was no actual formal evaluation of this. It was, it was kind of like what Frank mentioned earlier. We did not strive for the perfect message. We just tried to communicate, communicate, communicate constantly. And when something changed, it's like, that's it. That's the new message. And this is why it is. And try to explain it and, and move on. And um, so that, that's kind of how we did it. But we didn't have any specific, it, when, when you're in an emergency type of situation, you don't really have time to sit down and do what you would normally do market type of research. You have to just jump in there and listen to who you're trying to reach, listen to what will work best for them, and then continue to, to discuss it with them. Is this reaching uh, your, your clients or is this reaching your neighborhood or your your you know, sphere of influence. And if not, then we just try something else. So try, 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 try. Thanks for that, Julie. There are a lot of questions um, from the audience on social media and digital strategy. Um, there, are, are there are really two buckets, if you will, of, of the questions. Um, on the one side, and, and actually, Julie, you highlighted some of the tools you've used. Uh, it's what tools, resources, did you use to learn or strengthen your digital strategy? Uh, and on the other side of, of the question is for communities with lower access to internet or social media, uh, what tools were helpful for reaching across the digital gap? Uh, Dr. Go or Frank, would you like to Dr. go? Yeah. Well, what I'm hearing, Nadine, is really probably a, a desire for more training or information about how public health can use social media. And so I think that an area that that's an opportunity um, that's been identified that that I would like more <laughs> information about. Um, you know, one area that we're we've been asking about is TikTok. How do we how do we use TikTok? Um, and we've been pretty reluctant to go there um, because we, we don't have the expertise. But we um, and the city is hesitant. Um, we do rely on um, those users though. So, for example, with our our art contest with youth, we are asking. As a, as a part of their entry for their, the prizes that many prizes that we have for the vaccine promotion materials that they create, that they post so that they put on their Instagram or TikTok um, their little video or whatever it is. So, so we're, and we've done that before with our tobacco um, youth advisory committee where we're really relying on them. They're the experts on social media to use their networks. And we also have community-based organizations that are pretty savvy with this kind of thing. So, so that's how we can extend our reach. Um, I think I had another uh, point, but I'll let Frank chime in. Just quickly, it, it's, it's a skill and it's not something we can pretend we all know how to do, right? So we have to, we have to hire staff that have these skills, that have these media skills uh, in these new platforms that they can bring um, to, to us so we can use them successfully. Because if we try to pretend because we have our own Twitter and Facebook account personally that we're somehow going to effectively communicate, that's not going to work. The, the, there are professionals that know how to do this and we need that expertise in public health. Absolutely. And both of you driving home, all three of you driving home the point around um, these, these foundational capabilities of public health and the need to actually invest in communications as, as one of those uh, capabilities, certainly. Um, we have another question from the audience, uh, which is, we've already received several questions from people at local health departments about booster dose messaging. At this point, uh, what messages are you finding most effective about boosters and second booster doses, especially for those who got their primary series but haven't stayed up to date? There's certainly been a drop off each round of of vaccines, you know, we've seen a smaller percentage uh, get get those. And I think, you know, our messaging, and, and I think Dr. Goma had mentioned it earlier, that every message that we go out, that we send out, regardless of what the subject is, says, please get vaccinated and get up to date because it is the safest and effective, most effective way to help prevent, you know, severe illness. And so making it the primary message has really been our goal you know, as we move forward with it. Um, it's getting harder. It's getting harder every day to convince folks 
um, uh, around these series. And so we just keep talking about vaccines in general. Most vaccines that we get come in a series. Um, you know, our flu vaccine changes every year and we ask people to get that. So we just try to normalize it for folks so it doesn't feel like this, oh, there's just another dose that needs to be administered. Um, this is how vaccines work. Uh, and so, you know, we're just trying to use the science and the information we have available and continuing to hit the message that, you know, vaccines are the safest, most effective way to protect yourself. Um, we, we have been messaging for quite some time that um, it, the vaccine is a three-dose series, like other vaccine series. Um, and so you're not done yet. For the mRNAs, it's three doses. And so that was how we messaged with the booster. Um, and the data is very compelling. And so for, for the, the need for a booster. And so that's, that's a little bit simpler. With this next shot, it's harder. And um, just to share a story, um, I'm going to get my parents vaccinated on Friday. And um, they are, my dad's 80. He's a retired physician who practiced in the United States for 30 some, 35 years. And, and when I called in to say, let's go get your shot, he said, but it's just recommended, right? Or it's just optional, right? And I'm like, oh my goodness, even, you know, the, even people who should know, who know, I'm like, you're 80 years old, you need to get the shot because but that's a failure of our messaging that we are confusing people and not making it clear that people 65 and older, which I think Dr. Walensky has, you know, come out and stated, but it's not out there enough. They should get their fourth shot. Um, so in the face of BA2. So I think um, there's work to do for us to, you know, to make that message clear because people are confused. And language matters, right? I think a major misstep for us early on as a public health field was talking about people being fully vaccinated, right? So after the second dose, it was being described as being fully vaccinated. And that, that language came back to bite us, unfortunately. And so um, hindsight's 2020, of course, but um, it really is important, you know, as these things are evolving, that we, we make sure that our language aligns with what we know about you know, vaccines and, and, you know, the interventions that we're proposing. So we've got just our final minute for um, our closing question. Uh, and so just a, a brief uh, closing tip. Uh, this question is, we've gotten many questions about, and we've spoken to this, messaging fatigue and, and maintaining communication. What's your closing tip uh, for how to maintain communication without having people tune out as we move forward? Locally, uh, one of the things that I did when there was a lull is got out, got out of the media, you know, so it wasn't the same face. The deputy administrator did a lot. Um, we had a lot of other people pushing the message forward. Um, and the idea was that, you know, me get out of there so that they're not seeing me constantly every single day. But then if I pop up again, uh, hopefully they'll pay more attention like, oh, something must be happening. So it's, it was that kind of thing, just sharing the messaging and, um, and you know, just make, also putting other public health messages out there, continuing with those too, because not, that's all still going on as well, so. Right. And we're, we're trying to use our newfound fame to, you know, get messaging out about other, you know, other public health issues. But I think we've scaled down the messaging so it's not as frequent. It's really when something changes or there's new information to provide and it's more targeted. So if there are populations where we have uh, deficiencies in vaccination rates, for example, we're targeting those populations versus doing broad community communications about getting vaccinated. So um, it's kind of a mixture of scaling back a little bit and then targeting your messaging more specifically to populations you're trying to reach. Dr. Go? But I think that's great advice from both Julie and Frank. Um, I think that what I've seen is that people come to us when they're scared and when there's, there's um, ambiguity. And I think being ready to just, we're always here and being and doing what Julie said in the beginning, communicate, 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 that people will come to us and so that we're prepared with those messages when they're, when they're, looking for that information again. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Go, to Frank and, and Julie um, for taking the time uh, to join us today uh, and for all that you and, and your departments are doing to promote and, and protect the public's health. You've just really shared such important lessons, advice, uh, strategies and, and approaches as it relates to public health communications. Uh, and our mission at PHCC is to support uh, the health and well-being of communities across 
uh, the U.S. through these types of timely science-based uh, messaging and, and communication resources. So we truly appreciate uh, the feedback that you have provided. Uh, we're going to leave you all with taking a moment to answer uh, this question in the Zoom pop-up box uh, about the topics uh, that would be most useful to you uh, to learn about, whether it's in a tool or a guide or training. Uh, we'll keep this poll open so that you can select uh, these options and you can select more than one option. This will help to tailor uh, the types of, of uh, opportunities and resources that we provide in the future through the Public Health uh, Communications Collaborative. And as you complete that poll, we wanna uh, uh, remind you that there are resources uh, on communicating about COVID-19 on our website that you can go to at any time to gain those resources. So our latest resources there that you're seeing on the slide, we've got answers to tough questions on booster doses, uh, on mass guidance, on pandemic fatigue, the misinformation alerts. Lots of you expressed interest in misinformation. We've got misinformation alerts that you can uh, get some of those tips and strategies that our speakers have discussed today, as well as building bridges on how to use build bridging, uh, bridging statements to effectively address specific communications issues. And, what mask should I wear? A visual guide on best practices for mask wearing. And now, in addition to those uh, resources that we have available uh, and, and the insights that we've shared today, as we, uh, we've mentioned earlier, you're going to find more spotlights and communications lessons from the field in our new resource, uh, which is called Communicating Through COVID-19 and Beyond, Impact and Insights from the Field of Public Health. And that's going to be included in our webinar survey email this afternoon, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and this group, those of you in attendance, are the first to have access to the new resource, and that's going to be publicly launched tomorrow. As you read through these insights from our, your colleagues, we hope you'll share your reflections, your learnings uh, with us by tagging us on social media. Lots of conversation about social media today at ph underscore comms on, uh, on Twitter or our Public Health Communications Collaborative on LinkedIn. And in the survey today, we ask you to continue to please provide us with feedback, feedback on today's survey, sur uh, webinar that's going to help us uh, tailor our offerings in the future. And we'll also have a recording uh, of today's webinar that's available on the website later this week. Saw some uh, questions about that, but it will be available later this week. Thank you all again for attending today's webinar. Thank you for what you each do uh, to promote and protect the public's health. Stay safe and be well. Take care, everyone. Thank you.